Great. Awesome. Hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. That way y'all can see. Also, too, I know I didn't say this before, but for every time that we meet in this class, if y'all can have a set of over-ear headphones of some kind, I'm going to be continuously playing like audio examples, um, and you're going to get the most out of that if you can listen to those audio examples with some kind of over-ear headphones versus earbuds. But I know I didn't say that last time, so if you don't have some with you right now, that's perfectly okay. But moving forward, if you could have that, that would be awesome. Okay, uh, y'all can see my screen. Uh, right? uh, sir, uh, sorry, I'll be right back. It's because I borrowed the um, a pair of headphones from the um, department, like uh, you were saying last week. Sure. You're gonna go grab yeah, them. I'll be back. Uh, yes, I'll be back real quick. I got the headphones. Excellent. I might just play a couple today, but I know for sh I know for sure in the future I'm going to be kind of playing audio examples throughout. That way, y'all can just kind of hear the stuff that I'm talking about, and we can start to train your ears on like how to listen for this stuff. Because I'm not going to lie, like when I first got into this recording stuff, um, there was a huge learning curve, like in a bad way. That meant like I was like, oh my gosh, where do I even start? There's just so much information out there. I'm kind of confused and. I had some friends help me along the way, but it is kind of a lot of information to like take in and especially with training your ears. Like when we talk about EQ and compression, we'll talk about those things, but I also want you to like listen to like what that does to specific things. But anyways, I digress. Okay, if y'all can see my screen, today we're gonna talk about the recording studio and personnel. So your homework for this past week was to read chapter one. So I'm just gonna ask y'all some questions and uh, not not to anyone specifically. I'm just going to kind of gauge the class on what we think we know and 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 what we're going to learn. Okay, so chapter one basically introduces the professional recording studio environment and the people that work in a studio. So who can kind of describe to me? You can just shout out the answer. Like, what what does a professional recording studio environment look like, and and how does it maybe operate? Oh, well, let me start this off. Well, maybe, um, well, you know, you have like the basic, you know, um, mixing uh, software slash um, equipment. For example, uh, you got to have uh, monitors, you know, like speakers. You need a, 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 a mixer, um, <clears throat> some, some uh, mics, some uh, type of a uh, sound. Uh, cancellation panels and and, 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 and and stuff like that. Okay. Am excellent I going answer. the right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anybody else? Excellent answer. Crickets, not sure. Um, does it, um, would the um, kind of environment you're using um, also count towards the um, question? Yeah, very much so. So check this out. If y'all can see my slideshow over here. This thing is so obnoxiously large. How do I minimize this? Okay. All right, so let's take a look at this picture right here. So the professional studio environment, you guys can take notes. So here's what I recommend, folks. I recommend that you just have a little notebook, or just something small that you can write down, just a couple bullet points. I don't need you to write down like every single word that I say, but there are just some bullet points that I think We'll help you along the way, and if you can write this stuff down, it's just going to retain a lot better than you just listening when we talk. Okay, so the professional studio environment is made up of one or more acoustic spaces that are specifically designed for the purpose of capturing audio. So as you can see, this is just kind of like a room, um, but what makes it a ideal recording space is because it's professionally acoustically treated. You can tell because... It's got nice wood floors. There's like some unique paneling on the wall. Uh, you can tell the, the paneling patterns are also in different directions. Like all these ones on the back and side wall are vertical, yet these ones on the back wall are horizontal. There is a reason for that. Um, and we'll talk about that as when we talk about the next chapter, which is about sound and treatment a little bit more. Uh, you're going to learn about this thing called diffusion to where when you, let's say I I 
I'm in the practice room at Olu. You know how it like echoes all over the place? So that room has absolutely zero diffusion because when you say something in that room or you clap your hands, the sound just continuously bounces around everywhere without really without really running into anything uh, to stop it, you know? Because remember, we learned in physics or whatever, like every every action has an equal and opposite reaction or whatever. So when you clap your hands or when you say something in the practice room or play your instrument, that sound is going to keep bouncing around until it either dies away naturally or runs into something that can resist resist it. Um, am I going too fast? Um, no, no, I think you're good. Okay, if I'm going too fast, please tell me to slow down. Um, I'm, I, I like to just kind of go off or whatever. But okay, so let's say I'm in this room right here, pictured in this picture. If I if I clap my hands or if I say something in that room, um, the the sound is probably going to immediately hit one of these back panels, right? And then because there's a bunch of holes in it and lines in it, the sound is going to kind of get diffused by all those cracks. So the sound kind of has different places to like die off into if that makes sense and then um so if you can imagine like when you clap your hand there's just this imaginary waves that kind of come out um and then they hit the walls and kind of bounce around and because of because of the way the walls look and acoustic treatment the sound is able to naturally be controlled and you're able to have a, a good a good space for recording so um in any studio whether that's your house or a professional studio, it's important to invest in acoustic treatment. Um, uh, that way you can capture the best audio recordings. And so even for voiceovers, podcasts, and audiobooks, um, it helps to have a space dedicated to capturing your art in the best possible light. So does anyone have any questions about what what's in a professional studio environment and like what, what that kind of looks like? Regarding the... Uh the uh, the uh, panels is that actual wood or like uh, is it like just like you know is it actual wood? Yeah, it's just it's just regular wood. And and the whole the whole thing about acoustic treatment is that it's it doesn't have to be crazy expensive. Like like I said before, what a lot of people do is they'll put up um, you know like the comforters that you sleep with or like a big thick blanket. Yeah. They might put that up on the walls or something in in a, in a space they'd like to record in. I mean that's like you're kind of on a, like a shoestring budget there, but at least, at least having that will make somewhat of a difference. And like I said before, if, if you ever step inside your closet and like clap your hands or like say something, you'll notice that the sound is a little bit more focused, a little bit more controlled than let's say you were in your bathroom or your kitchen where there's tile everywhere and the sounds kind of reflecting all over the walls. Um, Definitely. I tried it last time. And then it did work. I didn't hear anything at all. No echo, no anything at all. No sound bouncing off the walls, you know, or anything. Yeah, yeah. and that's because the your T-shirts and your clothes, those are acting as natural uh, sound diffusers. So the sound is going in between each T-shirt, and it's kind of getting absorbed into like the thick pants. I know I'm, I know I'm kind of like thinking outside the box, or whatever. But that's that's in essence what's happening in that room. So the sound kind of dies away quickly because. The, it's getting interfered by like the clothes or whatever. So that's like a DIY way to create a, a recording space, like in a house. Um, you'll notice that when you go into the practice rooms at Olu, like it's not like that at all. There, it bounces all over the place, and um, I, I myself probably couldn't practice in there because um, you know you're not getting an accurate representation of like what of what's happening with the sound or the music. But anyways, I digress. Okay, choosing a location. This is on campus, y'all. This is a cool spot that would be somewhat okay for recording. It depends what instruments. So one of the things you should consider when you're recording anything is you're either going to record it in a proper studio, which has acoustic treatment, or you're going to record it in a remote location. That could be um, the church. That could be outside. Like if I wanted to record an outdoor performance, um, that's that would be considered as that as well. So you don't always have to record in a studio, and um, you're gonna. There are pros and cons to using different locations. So if I were to like clap my hands in this space, what would happen? Um, 
well, if you were to record like anything over here at the uh, in the uh, yeah, chapel, um, well, there's like uh, you're gonna get a lot of sound coming off those walls, um, and you're probably not gonna get like in a uh, not like the uh, uh, what's that called the uh, the uh, proper sound of what you're playing or singing or, or whatever or whatever you're recording. You know, it's um, you're on you're on the right path. Um... What, what, just something to consider is that certain instruments would work best in a space like that and others would not like, and this is actually what I had encountered when I was speaking with Dr. Duggan about, uh, he had wanted us to put on like a faculty recital and we were trying to figure out where the, where the best place would be for that. And what we were contemplating was doing one here in the chapel, because obviously it looks beautiful and it sounds beautiful too, but certain instruments would just not work in there. Like if I try to play like a snare drum piece, it's it would be like pa 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 pa, and it just would be echoing all over the place. The people wouldn't be able to hear any clarity in in, in the snare drum playing because it would just reverb so much, you know. Um, so that would not be a good place for for maybe drums and percussion. And if I did one bass drum note, it would be like boom 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 boom, kind of bouncing around. But instruments that would work in here would be something like maybe. Professor Stovall, like a, her, she plays the bassoon, and the bassoon is an instrument that has a really difficult time speaking over other instruments, and so this would be a great place to record bassoon because it's almost like a natural volume like increase and a, like a natural. Um, do you get what I'm saying? It's just going to make the sound a little bit more open, which would be a great place for her. So. Does that make sense, folks? Like there, are, uh, in depending on the space, there are pros and cons to which instruments you record uh, in certain spaces. Yes, sir. Yep. Am I uh, let's have a question. Uh, yes, Gabriel. Is it? Uh, yeah. So, like in the chapel, it was when you were saying like the um, kind of like examples for what instruments will work best. Is also like the organ kind of like the example in the chapel, since there's like one like um, kind of like another level up. Yeah, exactly. That's a great example. So the organ is ideal for this space because the organs are naturally kind of quiet. And so when you're when you have something that's a, that's massive like an organ, it's just going to naturally amplify in a space like that. So that would be another great example. Singers would also be good, too. And uh, I would imagine like stringed instrument, basically anything besides percussion, because uh, it's just going to be way too boomy in there, um, if that makes sense. So you can maybe make a little note of that of like because the reason why this is important is because if you all become working engineers one day, uh, you might have a client that's like, hey, I want to record my drum set solo in this church. And you have to be the engineer that's like, hey, I would recommend against that because of the way acoustics work. Maybe we could record this in a in, a, in this kind of a studio. And you as the engineer need to make that call because you're the one that's kind of organizing the recording session. And if you have a, a musician that wants to record with you that doesn't necessarily know anything about acoustics, you are the professional. It's your job to tell them like, hey, we can do that. But as the professional, I would recommend we do this instead. Um, does that make sense? Um, and why that's important to know that? Yes, sir. Great. Okay. And then we have the control room. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you all give me the answers to these. But uh, what's in a control room? Let's get let's get maybe Desiree or Susan or Gabriel. What do you think? That's great. Um, what what was the um, name of the room again? I'm sorry. It's called the control room. Like, what's where some of the equipment is? What's what's in there? Like, what kind of stuffs in there? It's like where the mixers like are and um. I have that word. It's in the tip of my head, but like I can't like think of it for some reason. I know what it is. Though. Take a look at this picture right here, okay? So what's what do you see in this picture that's there? It's like also monitors. There's like speakers. Um, and there's some acoustic. And there's, like, there's some acoustic panels in there too, right? Uh, yeah, there is. Kind of like blue and gray looking. Yes. Yeah. Is that also kind of, Is that also like um where the environment um the uh, kind of like work environment for music comes into play as well? 
Yes, that's exactly right. So you've got some chairs, you've got a mixing console. Some like not every control room has this. So this is just one specific example. Like obviously in in my house, I I don't have something like this. That's way too expensive. I've got a more of a home project studio type setup. But anyways, in this room, a control room is ide- sorry, a control room ideally should serve as a space that is optimized as a critical listening environment. So y'all can make a little note of that. So the the control room is where the engineers kind of, it's kind of like the, the hub. It's like where all the audio runs through and they can control how it sounds, all that good stuff. Um, acoustic treatment is highly recommended for all spaces in a studio, but especially in a, uh, especially in a critical listening environment. Headphones work as a great alternative to acoustic treatment. Why is that true? Why, why, do, why would headphones work at a, as a great alternative to spending a lot of money trying to acoustically treat a room? Well, maybe because um, maybe you don't have to buy uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the acoustic, acoustic treatment at all, like the cancellation panels. Um, maybe they're like, you know, like a little bit expensive and you just want to go like old school with the headphones. Like you can like hear the uh, sound, you know, clearly in your yeah. ears. Yeah. So with the headphones, they kind of cover your whole ear to where it's like a natural acoustic treatment because it's kind of isolating the sound. Does that make sense? So head, like there's a lot of people out there that I actually fell into this category myself when I was trying to build my studio. It takes time because it, it takes money. You know, honestly, at the end of the day, Money is kind of, frankly, what makes the world go round. So as you, you try to start with a budget, with what you can afford, and then as you get better, more experience, you purchase better things. But I would recommend, and this is where I started, is just starting off with a good set of headphones because you can, you can make a lot of headway with very little tools. You know what I mean? And one tool that you probably should have, especially as a professional musician, it's probably a good set of headphones. Like if you ever listen to a symphony, with a good set of headphones, it's like, oh my gosh, it's like crystal clear, you're there, beautiful sounds, highly recommend it. Okay, any questions about a control room and what's in there? Um, no. Ladies, any questions? Kind of silent. Not sure? Okay. All right, let's I keep don't going. Have questions. No questions? All right, what is the artist? Who is the artist? Yes, is Billie Eilish. Did I say that is an example of a artist? But Susan, what do you think the job is of the artist in a studio? And like, what's like, what's their job? Well, I think personally, is maybe like creating what's the. You're on the right path. Keep going. A theme or a message that they're trying to go for. And okay. maybe like it could, a theme can go not only one song, but it can also go for a whole album. Yeah, excellent. Um, yeah, that's all I can go for right now. And that's okay, that's, like- that's still an excellent answer. So, she, <laughs> so Susan made some great points right there. Anybody else can maybe tag on? Uh, maybe it's, um, you know, um, it's, it's the- Part or like maybe one of the uh, ingredients for the for the uh, like it's essential for the music uh, this music uh, recipe you know like in general. Yeah, right. Because right. the the music really doesn't exist unless someone performs it, right? Right. Okay, so let's check this out. The performer is the one that's, or I'm sorry, the artist is the person that's performing on the recording. Keep in mind that the artist may not always be the person who actually wrote the song or owns the rights to it. An example of that would be when one artist, let's say Billie Eilish, covers a song from another artist. Have you all seen that before when an artist does that? Like when they cover someone else's song? Yes. Okay. So, yes. Yeah, right. So there's a difference and this is kind of important for you to note. Um, Billie Eilish sings this song by the Beatles called Something. But what a lot of people don't understand is a lot of people think she wrote this song, which is actually incorrect. Uh, who Do you know who wrote this song originally? I actually kind of gave you the title already, but um, 
this is the Beatles. Like they wrote that song. Beatles. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's important to kind of know the difference and especially in the recording world, um, you kind of need to know stuff like that. Of It's not necessarily important, but it, it does if you want to like be in charge of finishing a product from beginning to end, because I'll give you a reality check. If you wind up, please make a note of this. This is actually really important. So let's say, let's say you all graduate or whatever, and you decide to start recording some music. If you wind up recording a song that you, that you uh, don't have permission to record, you actually could get sued. Uh, that happens sometimes because a lot of a lot of artists will record a cover song, professionally release it and sell it, and they don't have permission uh, from the record company who released that track originally to do so. And so that's actually a really good way to get into legal trouble, um, and and all that stuff. Like I won't dive too far into that, but basically, basically. Um, you need to be aware of like who owns who owns some of these songs and um, and all that good stuff. Like for example, if you're a, if you're a professional artist and you try to record a cover song from the Beatles, their managers actually need to get permission from the Beatles managers um, who own that music or the rights to that music in order for them to get permission to publish that song like on the radio or something. Does does that kind of make sense? Yes, sir. Just so, a, just a quick. Question. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. How, how would that work? Uh, let's say um 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 I I don't do it on purpose. You know, it's just like a beat I have in my head. You know, I I, I put it in the software and then um uh, you know I upload it to YouTube and then uh you know it comes viral and everything. But let's say that that beat came out like in, in the uh I don't know the uh the nineties and I didn't even know you know it existed already. Yeah. You know, you're, you're, um, you're, you're, uh, I know, I know where you're going and, and that has to deal yeah. with like sampling and stuff. And actually, um, you technically do need to get permission if you, if you plan on releasing that and getting income from that. Yeah. Um, although I'm going to say this and you know, it might not be the right thing, but the people who right. actually check, I'm not sure, you know, you can, you can kind of get away with it, but I know for sure, like really big major artists, Anytime they sample anything from somebody else, like they have to get permission because uh, when you're when you're selling like if you're just in Timberlake or something, you're obviously right. selling like millions of albums. And if you sample somebody else's work, uh, people are going to find out about it because he's a major artist. And like when they listen to his music, they'll be like, hey, that song was sampled from so and so. And that person didn't get permission to do that. <laughs> you know what right. I mean? Right. So in the it, that's a very big deal in the major artist world. Like if it's just you and me, uh, probably not. No one's gonna say anything. You know what I mean? But let's say for example, you release a song and it gets really big. Like you wind up going global. Um, you're pro- that if you sampled someone else's work and you didn't get permission, that person might be like, hey, because this song is going real big and you sampled me, I get ten percent. You know, or you you'll find some way to negotiate right. that or something. But um, does that make sense? Yes, sir. So you just got to be real careful with that. And, and like in this example, Billie Eilish definitely got permission before she released this. Otherwise she would have been in a lot of legal trouble. Okay. What is a studio musician who can tell me all this stuff's in your book, by the way. I'm getting crickets. Okay. Here is what a studio musician is. A studio musician is a musician that does not belong in the group that gets hired to play solely on the recording to enhance the sound of the band or artist. Session musicians are the ghost writers of the music industry. Um, am I missing anybody? Somebody wanted to say something? Are you hold on? Someone's talking to me in the chat. Can't see. Uh, she was saying uh, the definition, but her mute, her mic is not connected right or something. Desiree. Hey, Desiree, are you still with us? Yeah, she's. Can you hear? Her? He I can, can like. She can hear you. Okay, but I can she, like barely hear she you. Was, 
She was trying to say um, what studio musicians were, but I I think her mic didn't just go through. Mic check, Desiree. No, I don't know what's wrong. I think I can hear you. Yeah, I didn't do anything though. <laughs> okay, can you hear me? Can you? Yes, yeah. I can hear you. Uh, what did you oh, want to okay. say about studio musicians? Tell me. Oh, um, I was just saying that they're the ones who are mostly just like just in the studio. There's a lot of performers that um, musicians that are just strictly recording. Um, musicians, uh, but they're, they're the ones who are like playing the music. I yeah. Guess. Yeah. So, so here's an example. Let's take someone like Michael Jackson, right? Michael Jackson is what he, is he a guitar player? No, he's just a singer, right? It's like all he does. Um, he's not the one that plays the instruments on his recordings. Like he, um, and we'll talk about this in a second, but he has some, he has like musicians that play the music for him. And all he does is sing over it. So all those other people that get hired, they're called studio musicians. Um, does anyone have any questions about studio musicians and what that means? No. Got it? Okay, cool. I'll talk about this a little bit more in a second. But Okay. Um, what's an arranger? What's that? You can still hear me, right? I can yeah, okay. loud and clear. <laughs> um, an arranger is uh, you're taking a song and you're just messing with it. Um, uh, keep going. And um, I've done this before, uh, where I messed around with one of the one of a song from front of sophomore year, and all I did was take out everything except for the vocals, and I put in different. <laughs> Um, instruments and that's basically what arrangers do they just take like one part or like a bass line or something and they just totally mess around with it and make it like a new song yeah that was a great great description so just to kind of clarify that for everybody if you want to write this down arrangers are musicians themselves they're like kind of composers that's why desiree has some experience in this because a lot of times composers to get extra work they'll also arrange stuff which Arranging and composing are two different things. Composing means composing an original idea, and arranging is kind of messing around with someone else's idea or maybe rearranging one of your own ideas. So that's kind of the distinction between the two. Uh, so arrangers are musicians that create custom scores for artists that want to perform a piece a certain way. So let's take example Frank Sinatra. Again, he's a singer. He doesn't really mess around with the other instruments. And so he's got a certain way that he wants to sing his songs. It's up to the arranger's job. Um, this guy should look familiar. He was hanging around with Michael Jackson, too. This guy's a legend. His name's, I'll tell you his name in a minute. But um, So Frank's like, okay, I want to sing my songs this way. And then it's this guy's job to be like, okay, I'm going to basically create the parts for everybody else uh, so that way you can sing the song the way you want to. Does that make sense? Does anyone have questions about what an arranger does? That, that, that's a better, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally understood what, what was, uh, what's it called in the PowerPoint, but that's, that's totally, yeah, I got it in my mind. Yeah. Makes sense totally. now. You guys can write, and I'm going to put these PowerPoints up on Blackboard as well. That's why I'm videotaping this lecture as well. So in case you want to go over this stuff again, you may do so. Okay. Does anyone have any questions about arrangers before I go on? Got it? Great. All right, what is a producer engineer? Oh, what's a producer? What's that? A uh, producer. Oh, never mind. Oh, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> okay, um, a producer is, well, they make music, basically. They are the ones who give finance, and they give not only finance, but also give the materials and to make i guess to make you're on the right happen. path keep going is that you susan <laughs> yeah it sounds yeah coming up with a good yes, answer sounds that's good. Keep me. Going. um to make it happen to make music basically like um that's okay someone help her out yeah Tag i got you um 
So a produ producer basically it's the one that, that um, controls the uh, the uh, that works in the in the uh, control room, but also um, arranges you know the the music itself. It's the one that that is working on the mixer you know, adding those um, mixing all those tracks you know adding all those instruments into one single song, and uh, and yeah. Okay. I think that's that. Anybody else before I give the answer? Okay. So check this out. A producer is basically, to basically sum it up, a producer is this like outside person that's also a part of the, uh, also in some way related to the group or artist or whatever. But that person basically organizes the music uh, for, for the artist. Okay. So like I said before, Michael Jackson, he's the artist, but this gentleman right here, He's really famous. His name's Quincy Jones. Can y'all write down his name? His name's Quincy with a Q. Last name Jones. This guy, uh, obviously, he's he's around these monumental musicians like uh, Frank Sinatra and Michael Jackson. But he he was the producer for Michael Jackson and the arranger for Frank Sinatra and many others. But as a producer, he basically organizes all the music for Michael Jackson. So if Michael Jackson's like, hey, I want to. Uh, Basically, Quincy Jones is his partner, so he'll say, "Hey, Quincy, um, I wanna, I wanna write this, I wanna write a new song, but I want it to be more hip hop based. Um, can you come up with something for me to sing over?" And so Quincy's like, "Yeah, okay, I'll come up with the music, and and we'll work together on what what you like, and then if it's the song that you want to sing over, we'll put it on the album." And he's like, "Okay, great." So Michael doesn't have to worry about the music at all. It's Quincy's job to like, you know, that's a lot of pressure to like, you know compile uh tracks and, and all that good stuff and so that doesn't necessarily mean that quincy plays the music on all the tracks he's kind of the manager for the music so he might be like okay as michael jackson's music manager i'm gonna hire a band or multiple bands to like come up with songs and then we'll present them to michael when i guess they're ready to go that's actually how a lot of his albums were made like he didn't really touch any instruments I'm going to see if I can play this video real quick. That way y'all can see a little bit of um, what that is. Let me see if I can open this. Sometimes the internet is lame. It doesn't work very well. All right, check this out. Let's watch this together. Only pay for what you need with... What goes into a... Oh my gosh, so many ads. Go away. In late 1982, Quincy gathered his A-team at Westlake Studios in Los Angeles. It was here they set about recording what was to become the biggest selling album of all time. Quincy goes into the control room. We're all standing there waiting to see what he's going to say. You know what he told us? Oh, I love this song. He said, okay, guys, we're here to save the recorded music industry. Boy, that's a heck of a mandate, isn't it? We wanted the sonic values of Thriller to really recharge the industry. From the start, they were under immense time pressure. One thing that I think worked for us is we didn't have time for paralysis from analysis. <laughs> we made Thriller in eight weeks. We did Paul McCartney first. The Girl is Mine with Paul McCartney, the duet. Uh, everybody was playing live. It was amazing. Okay, so all these people that you're seeing, these new people, these are all the session musicians that just got hired to play on that you, like, I would have never known that. Paul McCartney and Michael being shy in the studio and all that. I love you more than me. Take you anywhere. But I love you endlessly. As with the recording of Off the Wall, the relationship between Michael and Quincy was very close. 
it was a, like a father-son or big brother, little brother type relationship. You know, it was more than just him producing his music, I think. Quincy was like a dad to him. That was Okay, just to give you a little background, like obviously it's you can watch more of that, but it's just to show you that um there are there are multiple different roles that kind of happen. Um Okay, so in many cases, the producer is responsible for managing the recording project in all stages of its completion, which is basically what Quincy did. Quincy was kind of the, the manager for the recording session, being like, okay, Michael, go sing that song again, or hey, let's move on to this next song, and just kind of being a manager. Uh, the producer is also responsible for making logistical as well as even artistic decisions alongside the artist. And Again, Quincy Jones and, and uh, Michael Jackson are, are a great example because Michael trusted Quincy enough to be like, hey, if you don't think I sing a song well enough or if you don't think it's a good song, let me know and we can change it. You know, that, that takes a lot of trust for an artist to do that with, you know, the producer or whatever. And it's kind of a – it's like for me, whenever I write my own music, I'm very sensitive about – who tells me what to change about it because it's they're my songs and it's songs that like I have worked hard to create and it takes a lot of trust for me to trust somebody else to be like, Hey, take my music and do something with it. You know, it takes a lot of trust. So, uh, engineers, uh, facilitate the logistics in the recording session. They usually have minimal artistic input. So the engineers are, are just the ones that run the board. Um, so if I say like, Hey, if, um, like, let's say um, we're in the recording studio and uh, Gabriel, you're the one that's in the in the booth and I'm the artist. And I'll say, OK, Gabriel, can you uh, give me a little bit more vocals in the mix? And instead of you saying, no, I think it should be lower. It's like, no, you just got to kind of do what the artist says because you have minimal artistic input in this situation because I'm paying you to be the engineer, not like tell me how the song should go, if that makes sense. Um, and so you just so part of part of being in a studio is kind of knowing the boundaries and knowing your place in that situation. Does anyone have any questions about this? I know I'm kind of breezing over it. No questions. Sure, no questions. Okay. Like for example, if I was if I was an engineer on a Michael Jackson session. I would not be telling, as the engineer, I, I, my job is just to run the board. My job is not to tell Michael whether or not it's a good song or not, or like what if I sh if we should change the song. That's more the artist and the producer to kind of take care of that job. Um, does that make sense? Yes. No. Okay. So now we're yes. going to talk about. Yes. Great. <laughs> Thanks for the feedback. <laughs> um, now we're going to talk about the birth of the home studio, and this will be the last thing that we talk about today. Um, as you can see, all these recording studios, they look crazy big. Like, there's all this gear. But um, with the way technology has advanced, there are methods now that uh, don't require us to use so much technology and have all this equipment and have all this money. You can easily start a home studio like these people for like a lot less than than you might think you know what i mean I'm, I'm talking maybe a couple hundred dollars versus like several thousands of dollars um seems like a better deal this is actually more of how my studio is set up i've got a little interface some headphones some monitors and a computer that's kind of basically it it's kind of all i need really um all right i'm going to show you this little commercial just to show you um how some of these other people do it and, and, and maybe how they find out. Hold on. So watch this little video. They make little commercials and stuff. So you can get an idea what these people um, do. If I can find the video.
running with to my soul, develop the flow, the point stands. I'm the realest, I know, put on a beat, I get into my zone. Nobody help, I be good on my own, it's all love. I ain't got no foes, you see, I'm living this life like I'm golden, I'm rolling, chosen. See me wide out in the open, all it really takes is a little of devotion. Mix it with talent, I found the balance, expand my palette. Tell me what's the fun if you see no challenge. I'm overcome everything that stands in the way of my greatness. The future is mine for the taking. I'ma take everyone I came with you and for the moon like Apollo. All this good fortune, like I just said, the lotto. And this is all I wish, like a genie in the bottle. Smoke good, eat good, live good, it's the motto. I'm a slut, been grinding, waiting on my time And I'm a slut, pushing against the weight of me Put that work in, I'm surfing, shining like a diamond Under the pressure, I'm making treasure that was made for me Play for the major leagues. I took my time with the craft so patiently. I broke a heart of the words, it's a masterpiece. The boy came with the halo like Master Chief. I got the fam in the boot like Master P. And the devil's no match for me. I ain't really with the blasphemy. I just reflect on the past and I put it in a poetry. I'm a Under the pressure, I'm making treasure that was made for me. It is made for me. It made for me. Yeah, cool, huh? So that's just, just to show you that, like, you know, it's possible now to make really awesome recordings with uh, minimal tools, you know, and a lot of this stuff is a lot cheaper than it was maybe 10, 20 years ago. And like I said before, um, you guys remember when I was talking about Billie Eilish, even though I don't listen to her music, I still respect that, you know, her and her brother won like eight Grammys from using this exact equipment, um, in their house. You know what I mean? Um, am I losing anybody? Does that make sense? So like the idea of back in the eighties and the seventies and the sixties, like, you had to have access to stuff like this to make a record of any kind. Like you had to have access to a, a a console like that, or like one of the bigger ones to even, even make recordings. But because of technology and how, how far it's come and how quickly it's advanced, we're able to do all that stuff on the go now on the fly. Um, Did you notice how his interface was like a tiny little box? It wasn't like a huge console. Yes. Yes. Maybe so. Yes. Okay, so that little Zoom recorder, that's going to be our interface for this class. So the handheld Zoom recorder, um, I think it's in Dr. Hajek's office. Um, that's our portable interface. That It has microphones already on it. So just like that guy threw it in his backpack and kind of went on the subway, y'all are going to do that same kind of thing around campus. And you're going to take that Zoom and do different projects with it. Am I losing you? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, and then yes, you're gonna. Uh, we... Yes. Go ahead. Sorry. Question. Oh, uh, we only have one Zoom. I know, and that's why so, you're gonna yeah. have to rent it out for probably an hour at a time, or maybe two hours at a time, or whatever. You probably shouldn't need more than an hour at a time, and so uh, we're gonna do it like that, where it's just like any other thing. Which, speaking of which, I need to return those drum parts to the school. Thank you for reminding me. Um, does that make sense? So you can rent that out through, I believe, Desiree. Yes, you can. Okay, so go see Desiree, and what? here's what I recommend. I recommend that you either get wipes or, like, hand sanitize any interaction with that. That way we can eliminate the spread of COVID and all that good stuff. You're more than – I would recommend – this is just me personally. If you wear gloves of some kind as you handle this piece of equipment, and then when you're done, just dispose of the disposable rubber gloves. That way you can make sure that um, – you're not getting in contact with any of that, and you're also doing your best to prevent the spread and all that stuff. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay, so I have 10 minutes left, um, or just a couple minutes left. So the last thing I wanted to talk about is your project that you need to start working on for next week. Um, don't be don't be alarmed. I know I know we haven't dive in super far into it, but this project's super easy. Easy. I'm actually going to walk you through it right now. So for next week, I want you to read chapter two on sound and hearing, and I also want you to finish the session prep project. Okay, now to talk about that. So um, Dr. Hajek and I are going back and forth with each other on which program we're going to use um, because 
because I think she's going to buy it for y'all or some combination of that. Um, and so I'm waiting on her to make the decision on, on, on what she wants to do. But for now, we've come up with a way that we can do this on Audacity. So Audacity is a program that manages audio and music. It's our DAW. Um, who remembers what a DAW is? AKA it's a, a digital... A digital audio workstation. Yay, ten points. Yeah, it's a digital audio <laughs> workstation. Is which is where we which is where we're gonna manage all the audio that we record. So check it out. I'm gonna start Professor, over. Yes. Uh, uh, Susan is gonna listen through mine because her computer is dying. Okay, that's cool. All right, so check it out. In Audacity, I'm actually gonna start this over. So I'm gonna exit out. When you, this is a free program that I believe works on every computer besides Chromebooks. It's just Chromebook doesn't have the tech capacity to handle these programs, which is okay. You can do this at school. So I'm going to open Audacity. Looks like this, just kind of a blank screen. Okay, the only thing, I'm going to go more in depth about this next week, um, but really the only thing you need to do for this project is this. Um, and I'm recording this video wise, so you can just, uh, when I f upload this to Blackboard, you can just watch this video portion again if you get lost or get confused. Okay, so I'm going to open up the program and up top you have options such as file, edit, select, view, all these other things. For now, you're going to go to tracks, add new, and you're going to add a mono track. Again, we're going to go over all this stuff next time, but I just I just want you to do this very basic project first. So we're going to add one track, okay? Looks like this. You don't got to do anything to it except one thing. You just got to rename it. Okay, so it's going to say audio track here. You're going to change the name. Rename it. Okay, you're going to name this Local 1. Okay, you're going to repeat this process until you have all of these tracks here listed. This is on Blackboard. Let me pull it up real quick so you can see. Try to do this before time runs out. Um, we'll do blackboard. Uh, course materials. Okay, so if you look under session prep project, you're going to create this many tracks. You're going to create one track for vocal one, one for vocal two. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So I just created a track for vocal one. I'm going to create one for vocal two now. Tracks. Mono track. Name it. Vocal two. Great. Next. What would be the next track, Gabriel? What would I call that next one? You would call it acoustic guitar. Exactly. Okay. So I'm going to create a new track. Mono track. Great. You name it. And I'm going to create this many tracks. It should be 16, okay? 16 tracks. Um, so I'm going to label that, label these. Um, the tempo of the piece is 80 BPM. So we can go over here and change the tempo. So let's go to... See if we can maybe find tempo. Help. Change tempo. So you can go to effect. Change tempo. We won't be using this after this, so it's okay. Um, I don't know if you can change tempo in this. Let's see. Hope you can. For now, let's just do this. For now, don't worry about all these. Don't worry about these two extra things. Go ahead and just worry about the um, getting the track with all 16 of these tracks input in here. Okay. 
I'm going to delete this last part because we're going to modify this assignment. All right. Once you do that, you are going to click File, Save Project. You're going to save this project as. Obviously, you're going to fill out all these other tracks before you send this to me. Okay. Okay. You're going to save this as session, oops, session prep project. Please don't call it anything else. You're going to save that to your desktop or whatever. Save. Yes. Okay, it's fine. Okay, and then what you're going to do is you're going to attach this to Blackboard on that assignment. This is the session prep dot, I think it's called an AUP file. So it should look like that, session prep project dot AUP. You're just going to send me this. So when you go to Blackboard, session prep project, browse local files because you're going to attach it. Oops. Desktop, AUP, open. Excellent. And then submit. Um, does anyone have any questions on that process? Again, I'm sure you have questions, but again, you can watch this video again to kind of walk you through that. Um, I think we're going to be winding up going with Ableton. I'm not sure. I need to, again, I just need to confirm that with Dr. Hajek on what she's ultimately deciding to do. But to give you a little hint, I, I also did this project within Ableton. And it's the same kind of thing where I've got Vocal 1, Local 2, acoustic guitar, electric guitar 1, all the channels. Know what I mean? And I've got my drums grouped into a little drum bus. I've got my kick, snare, and my two overheads. Again, all you're doing for this first project is you're just creating tracks and labeling them with the proper names. That, that's all you're doing. You're not having to mess with anything else. And then maybe once we get into Ableton, we can mess with the tempo, change it to 80 BPM. Over here and then also change the time signature to 3 4. But again, you don't have to worry about that right now. I, I just showed you in Ableton, so we can do that today. All right, did I lose anybody? Um, no, Gabriel, doing okay? Desiree, Susan, all good. Excellent, we're good. Excellent. All right. Uh, real quick, Desiree, is the Zoom HQ recorder on campus right now? Like, do you actually know where it is? Yes, um, I have it. I'm turning. I'm turning it in today because I, I had it during the break. Okay, no worries. So that'll be in the office, and just maybe remind Dr. Hajek to buy new batteries if it needs new batteries. Um, do you still have my keyboard synth thing too? Yes, I was going to ask you about that. Okay, if you want, you can just leave it in my office and I'll pick it up whenever. Um, but, okay, sounds good. Is there, If no one else has any questions, then I'll let y'all go a couple of minutes early. No, no questions over here. All right. If I have a personal question. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, but, like, uh, after class, I think it's okay. Okay, sounds good. Um, if if y'all are good, then you're more than welcome to leave the video 